church. So we've been looking at Sunday school, what is the church? Where did it begin? And all that good stuff. We began talking about the church coming into existence and that Christ did not come to do away with the law, but to fulfill the law. And that God isn't just looking for another group, another religion, but he's looking for a group of people to be called out ones that are to be called out of the world. We looked at the word of God and how God's people were always a called out people. You look at Israel, they were always supposed to be outside of the world. When you look at Abraham in general, he was the center of the world to some degree because his father, Terah, was an idol maker. So those things that the world worshipped, Abraham grew up in, he knew them, but God said, I don't want you to stay there. I want you to do completely away with that portion of your life and come out. I have something better. I have something new for you. When we look at the church, it's not really any different. The church was never meant to be part of the world. They were always to be separate from the world. Now, God formed the church. Do you remember when it comes to the building, where did God begin with building the church? What is the most important stone in the building? The cornerstone. And for us as the church, who is the cornerstone? Jesus Christ. Then that chief cornerstone is extremely important because that tells all of the other blocks in the building where they go when laying the foundation. After Jesus Christ, who makes up the foundation of the church? The apostles and the prophets. Now, just a little fun side note. It doesn't make any difference one way or the other when it comes to theology. But there will be people that will argue that Judas's name was never on the bottom of the church. Because we know when you go to heaven, there's a four square city. And the names of the apostles are written on it. But Judas is not mentioned on it, they'll argue. But there will also be some that argues that neither was the other elected apostle that took his place. Some will argue that it was actually the apostle Paul that took his place. And that Paul's name is on the bottom of the foundation of the four square building. Does it make any difference to us? No, it doesn't do anything for our religion. But it is something interesting to know. And then we'll just have to wait till we get there one day to find out. But when we're looking at the church today, we're going to go a little bit more in depth. And we're going to look at the very beginning of the church. Well, before we go there, we talked about the primary purpose of the church last week. What's the primary purpose of the church? Nobody knows what the primary purpose of the church is. Do you know that? You just gotta look at me. We all know what the primary purpose of the church is. Is to do exactly what Jesus Christ said that he came to do. To seek and to save those which are lost. We know the Great Commission, Mark 16, 15. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That is the primary purpose of the church. Now, it does have other purposes as well, as we found in Ephesians 4.12, that we're supposed to edify the saints and edify the body of Christ, perfect the saints. We do that through edu education. Edification. We do it through education, the building up of others through edification, and, of course, evangelism. Now, today we're going to look at the early church. Would someone please read Acts chapter 17 and verse 6. Acts 17, 6. When they found them out, the Judaism and certain brethren under the rulers of the city crying, these that have turned the world upside down have come hither also. These are those that turn the world upside down. So today we are going to look at the early church. We've all heard time and time and time again, I wish I had an Acts 2 church. We need to be more like the founding fathers. We need to go back exactly how the founding fathers were. We need to go back exactly what, at the way it was in Acts, in the beginning of Acts. Well, the truth of the matter is, that's great to some degree, but the Acts 2 church was a baby church. Yes, they prayed, they had the power of the Holy Ghost, but they were a baby church. I saw a quote a long, long time ago, I can't remember exactly how it was, but basically it was 
a child making fun of the parent because they forgot to do something or they couldn't do something anymore, and the parent retorts with the comment, well, don't forget, I had to teach you how to use a spoon. Now, we all have that growing up stage. We all didn't just come into this world knowing what we know to the full maturity that we are now. We had a lot of learning to do. We had a lot of growing to do. We had a lot of, um, even when it comes to growing, learning, and et cetera. We'll just stop it there before I get myself into a bigger pickle. But the early church was no different. The church came into existence with the baptism. I shouldn't say it came into existence. It did not come into existence. But when the church came into being after Christ left, they didn't know everything we know now when it comes to religion. They didn't know everything we know about God. They don't know, didn't know about the spiritual gifts the way that we know about them now. They only had the Old Testament. They were very much a baby church. Now, if we go back to the very beginning of the church and work our way up, Really, the church between the ascension of Christ and the resurrection was completely different. I think it's safe to say that one would argue that the church really came into existence, or at least formation as we know it, when Christ started handpicking the disciples. I don't think that's an unfair assumption. Because from there, Christ was taking the disciples and he was teaching them. They were learning. They were growing. When it came to spiritual matters, he taught them in parables, but there were also times when, apart from the crowd, he would pull them off aside and give them a little bit more insight to what that parable meant. He was teaching them. There was a time when Jesus said, all right, give me a hands-on experience. So he sent them out. It was a learning experience. But then we come to the death of Jesus Christ. And that church, that building that he was working so hard on, does anybody want to take a guess at what happened to it? All the hard work, all the hours, all the painstaking efforts that Jesus Christ put into it, and what did the church do after he was dead? They separated themselves. They departed. After the death and resurrection, and even after the resurrection of Christ, the church scattered. Why? Because they were sheep without a shepherd, and they all went on their own merry way. If someone would please find John chapter 20, John 20 and 24 through 29. Jesus Christ had 
spent all his time forming the church, building it up, training the disciples from the time he got them, taught them spiritual things the best of his ability, and they were supposed to carry him on when he died, but when he died, they scattered, and that's where we're at right now. And if we're using, we're using Thomas as an example, and Thomas said, unless I see it for myself, I'm not going to believe it. So, down in, so when we're looking at Thomas here, the disciples, they were supposed to carry on the work of Jesus Christ, but they're at the point, at this point, okay, we've seen that he, some of them seen the, saw that he rose from the dead, but Thomas said, you know what, I've got my own way, Jesus is dead, and he's dead. The church is gone, so what point is there? And then he get, we get to the point that mom just read, unless I see him and touch him, I won't believe it, brother. Right and that's when Jesus appeared, and he touched him. So Thomas, even though he was supposed to continue the work of the church, the work that Jesus Christ left off with, he doubted. He went his own way until Christ said, you know what? This is me in the flesh. I've done exactly what I said. And even though it's not recorded here, for lack of better terms, you're going to need to pick it up. You're going to have to carry on the work I did. Next person we're going to look at is Peter. When we look at Peter during this time between the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and the ascension of Christ, he goes his own way. Now, Peter's a little bit different from Thomas. Peter, we know, he saw the empty tomb. He saw that Christ had risen from the dead. Now, we know if we go back a few days before the death of Jesus Christ, he told them right out that they, he was going to die, but he was going to rise again on the third day. But even though he said it in plain words, the disciples still didn't understand what he was talking about. But on Resurrection Sunday, Peter saw the tomb himself. He ran, he looked, he saw that it was empty. So Peter's a little bit different from Judas. But still, we do not find Peter during this time frame out doing the work of Jesus Christ, evangelizing the lost, going out, trying to build the church. But rather, Peter's done something different. He's done something altogether different. In John chapter 21, verses 14 through 17, John 4, John 21, 14 through 17, and I'll go ahead and read that. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to the disciples after he had risen from the dead. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Joseph, Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yes, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And he saith unto him, Feed my ship, my sheep. And he saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And he saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. And he saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved, because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Now, if we take in this scenario back to a few verses, what do we, do you know offhand what we find Peter doing? I know we didn't read it, but. Exactly, brother. And what was he by trade before Jesus found him? A fisherman. So Peter, he saw the empty tomb. He knew that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, rose from the dead. But where do we find Peter? He's not going to church, but he goes back to his old lifestyle. He goes back fishing at once again. And when we look at the situation, whatever it could be, we could say maybe he was there because he felt guilty, depression, whatever it was, and we're gonna you'll find out where I'm coming from here in a second. But Jesus asked him three different times, Will you feed my sheep? Well, if we would read this passage a little bit farther back, we would find that Peter went fishing, he comes back. And Jesus has prepared a fire. This fire, the Greek word used to describe it, is only used one other time in Scripture, period. And that is when, G when Peter is warming himself by the fire and the Daniel comes. <laughs> so we almost get the idea here that as Jesus is preparing supper, he has the fire going, and the whole time Peter is just taking in. You know, the last time perhaps that I smelled the smell was. I betrayed Jesus. And here Jesus is asking, Peter, are you going to feed my sheep? Are you going to work for me? Are you going to go back to your old ways? Because the whole point of training the disciples was to build the church. The church foundation itself is built on the apostles and the prophets. 
Peter is one of the apostles. And here he is fishing. He's supposed to go out and evangelize and go to the left church, but here he is fishing. And we get the idea that Jesus is just reminding him, do you remember when you denied me? You said long ago that you would follow me regardless. You whipped out the sword and you cut off Malchus's ear, but are you still willing to follow me? You betrayed me when the rubber met the road. You betrayed me. Do you remember that little girl in the whole time that Jesus is talking? Maybe Peter is just remembering this because the smell of fire is just taking him back to that point in time. So Jesus is asking him three different times, will you feed my sheep? If we're going to do it biblically uh, and bring out the number three, maybe it's one time for the Father, are you going to feed my sheep? Maybe the second time is for Jesus Christ, are you going to feed my sheep? And finally the Holy Ghost is trying to, Peter, are you going to feed my sheep regardless? So this is what we have going on. The church, that the, the apostles that were supposed to be building the church, they were scattered during this time. So in one of those 40 days while Jesus was here, what was he doing? He was getting the flock back together. They killed the shepherd, and when the shepherd was gone, the sheep scattered. The, the members of the church forgot what Christ had told them, and they dismantled themselves. And even when we turn to Acts chapter 1, if someone would please read Acts chapter 1, 9, and verse 11, 9 through 11. Acts 1, 9 through 11. When he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a fire received him out of their sight. While they looked steadfastly toward heaven, and he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. So we're in we're still we've reached the end of the time frame that we're talking about. We've reached the ascension of Jesus Christ. The disciples are all gathered together, and Jesus Christ is taken. They're supposed to be building the church, and what are they doing? They're lollygagging. They're staring at the sky. Jesus Christ is going to come back. Well, maybe. Now, I'm not saying this is the case, but maybe they were there. Maybe he'll be back in 30 seconds. Maybe he'll be back in five minutes. But no, whatever the case was, they were there standing at the sky. So during the ascension period, the resurrection to the ascension period, we had the disciples, the shepherds been cut off, so the sheep scattered. So the shepherd comes back, he has to gather them all together. Now they're all gathered together, and now they have to, Jesus has to send a messenger and say, you know what? Stop looking at the sky. Get to it. Get going. So we're looking at the formation of the church. So we're just getting there. So Christ had his work cut out for him. He worked so hard during those three and a half years of ministry, and then he had to come back for another 40 days to reassemble the troops because they scattered. And when he leaves, he has to send somebody, all right, he's gone, now get going to it. Now we're going to move forward to the next uh, big point on the kind of on the church timeline, and that is the baptism, is, and that's Acts chapter 2. And the reason that's the big point is because there wasn't a whole lot going on between the ascension of Jesus Christ and Acts 2. And there's a good reason for it. Because Christ told them not to do, well, let me back up. Christ told them to do one thing during this time frame. Would someone please read Luke chapter 24 and verse 49. Luke 24 and 49.
But they went to Jerusalem, and there they waited for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Now, we can go back and forth and ask ourselves, did they really know what they were waiting for? I mean, if Jesus plainly told them that he was going to die and rise again on the third day, and I mean plainly, it wasn't just parables like he did in the past. He plainly told them, and they still didn't understand that he was going to rise from the dead. Did they really know what they were waiting for? No, probably not. They just knew that they were waiting for the promise of the Father. Did Jesus give any examples of the baptism of the Holy Ghost during his ministry to the apostles? Absolutely, because there was one point, and I don't have it on my notes, now I'm note jumping. Kind of came off of me. But if you go back and recollect your memory and your thoughts, I can't remember the passage, but there's one point where the Bible says, and he breathed on them. That was giving him a sim that was symbolizing to them the coming of the Holy Ghost, because the Holy Ghost came in how? Like a mighty rushing wind. And what is a wind? It's a breath. Just like a breath that breathed into Adam at creation when he became a living, a living creature. I mean, before that, he was just us. But it was the breath of the Holy Ghost, or the wind of the Holy Ghost, that made Adam a living creature. Yes, just like that at Pentecost. And I'm not getting into when the church was formed or when it really began, or but just like at Pentecost, the Holy Ghost breathed life or breathed energy into the church. Because that's when things really came alive. But God had them go and tarry in Jerusalem to wait. Because A, that's where new life was going to come. B, that's where the power was going to come from. Not that the Holy Ghost didn't work in the Old Testament through men. Because he did. How did men prophesy in the Old Testament? Those, what was it, 70 that were um, given to give uh, aid Moses, and they all prophesied? Well, that was because the Holy Ghost dwelled in them at that point in time. Doesn't mean it, it stays there the whole, their whole lifetime. But he was in them. How did Bezalel and Belial? I don't think it was Belial. I'm getting my names mixed up, but uh, the two men that were just in charge of the tabernacle when it was being constructed. A holy act, yeah. They were given all wisdom and knowledge and all kind of work. Well, where did that come from? Through the indwelling of the Holy Ghost, working through them, showing them. And on the day of Pentecost, that's what was given to the church. But it was given in a more permanent manner. Because he was with you. And maybe he was there and involved you when he needed to and then departed. But there was coming a time that he was going to not just be with you, but he was going to be in you. And there was a new administration in the way that the working of the Holy Ghost was going to happen. And we see that in Acts chapter 2, 1 through 4. And I'll just go ahead and read that because we are Pentecostals after all. Acts 2, 1 through 4. This is the Pentecostal passage. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues, and spake as the, Holy, as the Spirit gave them utterance. The other thing that's also important to note that's not here in your notes is the unification of the church through tongues. We find that this is a giving back to God's people, something that man lost way back when. If we go way back to Genesis chapter, chapter 11, we find a group of men that gathered themselves and said, you know what, we're not going to subject ourselves to God. And they built themselves a tower, and we know it reached in the heavens, but when you study out, it was supposed to be just above where the flood line was before. Kind of like talking about God saying, send on the rain again. We're a little bit higher than what you were last time. You're not going to take us out this time. And God confused the language and scattered them. Where at one time, man used language to unify themselves against God. God came down and wrote that language and divided it. At Pentecost, God united the church through the common tongue. When we look at the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the baptism the Holy Ghost was the replacement for Christ being with his disciples. Another reason that he was in them and not just with them any longer. 
Would someone read um, John chapter 16 and verse 7? John 16 and verse 7. John 16 and verse 7. So what did Jesus say? As the Holy Ghost, he needs to come. And it's not that he wasn't here before, but he needs to come in a different way. But as long as I'm here guiding you, he cannot come. When we look at the Holy Ghost, now don't lose that with me. Remember, Jesus Christ in his mortal body, and glorified body, could only be in one place at one time. The Holy Ghost is everywhere at one time. So, what Jesus was saying is, I can be here in front of you, instructing you, but there's going to come, there's going to come one that if you allow him, that will indwell within you, and he will guide you into all truth and teach you all things. So it's not just one person in front of the church, but it's like you now all have your own little tutor now to go with you everywhere you go, as long as you have the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And he dwells within you. So Jesus had to go that the Holy Ghost may come and perform the work that he desired. And that's what we see on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And the disciples now had to learn something different. Would someone please read at, uh, not Acts, Matthew chapter 9, verses 14 and 15. Matthew 9, 14 and 15. Matthew 9, 14 and 15. If you have it, just go ahead and read it. They came to him, the disciples of John, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast oft, but they, but thy disciples fast not? And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn, as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them, and then shall they be fast. So, Jesus was there with them. There was no reason for them to fast. He is our mediator. He is our high priest. After he ascended, that's when the disciples learned they had to pray and fast for themselves. Jesus could no longer do it for them. Now, let's read. I'll read Acts chapter 4, 23 through 33. And being let go, they went their own way in company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. Who by thy mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For a truth against the holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together. For to do whatever they hand, their, thy hand and their, thy counsel be determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants with all boldness they may speak thy word. By stretching forth thy hand and heal, and thy signs and wonders may be done by the name of the Holy Child Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken, where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were one heart and one soul, neither said of any of them that ought of the things that he possessed was his own, and they all had things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon all of them. Now let's look at this. Without any ice cream. If we go back to John, what time frame are we looking at? Was it before the resurrection, after the resurrection, after the ascension? Because we have to take it in context. If we look at John chapter 9 that was just read, we are looking before the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. So Jesus was with his disciples. It was during the time period. They were, his disciples were under attack from the Pharisees. At, why don't they fast? And Jesus said, they don't need to while I'm with them. 
But what was the prayer life of the apostles like during this time? I mean, how many times did Jesus rebuke them? Can't you pray with me even an hour? Their prayer life wasn't near what it was supposed to be. But on the day of Pentecost, everything changed. And now we're looking a few days after Pentecost, and while it does not say that they fasted, but man, they know how to pray now. Why do they know how to pray? Because he is no longer just with them, but he is in them. The Holy Ghost is teaching them how to pray. And while it doesn't say that they fast yet, perhaps they have fasted. But we're seeing great things happen because of the power of the Holy Ghost that is residing within each of them. And now things are changing. And we've jumped ahead. I've jumped ahead a little bit, but the Holy Ghost was no longer with, just with man, but he had the possibility of being inside man. John chapter 14 and 17, where Jesus said, uh, He is with you, but he shall be in you. Now, I'm going to jump ahead and we might speed up a little bit. But it's the baptism of the Holy Ghost that transforms men drastically. When you look at the day of Pentecost, it's what took Peter from being a coward to being courageous. There at the low damsel, a girl scared him and said, he said, I, I'm not with him. But yet on Pentecost, Peter was the first one to stand up and preach a message to the entire city there. Now the early church, we talked about that it was a baby church. Yes, the early church had good qualities, but if we look at anything, we can pick out the good and we can pick out the bad. The Acts 2 church, and it might have some great strong points, but I don't want to be a baby church. I really don't. God has so much more for me. He's given me so much instruction. Can I make good things from the baby church? Absolutely. But I want to go above and beyond. You know, I don't want to stay on the milk, but I want to dig into some sand. So when we look at the early church, they did have their problems. We're not going to go into detail reading scripture, but the one, the very first one was, who did the Jews think that salvation was for? Just them. Just them, brother. The Jews thought that salvation was just for the Jews. Was that the case? No. Jesus had to wake in their eyes. And we have, I have read down the account of Cornelius, where Peter is sleeping on the rooftop, and he has a vision of all these clean animals and unclean animals, and God says, what I call clean, don't you dare call them. And then Peter goes and he talks to Cornelius and he's preaching to them. And while he's preaching to Cornelius, what happens? Not only do they get saved while Peter's, pre while Peter's preaching, but they receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And if that's not enough to blow Peter's mind, guess what he does? He goes back to Jerusalem, which was the headquarters of the church world then, and he gathers everybody together and he says, guys, you aren't going to believe this. They got it just like we got it. And they're a bunch of Gentiles. How can this be? But salvation is not just for us. It's for them too. And it's just like Peter's mind was blown. <laughs> and then you have, like I said, it was a baby church. We talked earlier about the example I see where the child was making fun of the adult. Um, they forgot to do this or whether they couldn't remember how to do this anymore. And the parents said, don't forget, I had to teach you how to use a spoon. They were a baby church. And they needed instruction. So that's why we have um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 all the way through 14. Where Paul's giving instruction on the gift. This is the way that they're to be This is what needs to be done. And then we can go a little bit farther. And I'm not going to remember all my references. What exactly they go back to possibly. But then Paul. Then we get into the big, the big argument. How many tongues of interpretation and prophecies can we have in a church service? So Paul addresses that too. It says, let everything be done in decently in order. Let two or three speak in tongues and let one interpret. And then go back to two or three speak in tongues and then one interpret. So we have them give, Paul giving them instruction on how the church should operate, how the gifts should be used. And don't just be used of God and be used of God, but do it out of love. And that's where 1 Corinthians 13 comes in. It's not about love, 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 and love your brother, love this. It's all about showing that you can do all these great things for God and be used in all the great gifts. But if you don't do it out of love, you're just a sounding brass. Not that you, God not, isn't receiving glory and honor because God will use whatever vessel. And that's a whole other topic. But 
Whenever you're using the gifts of the Spirit, it needs to be out of love. And then we come into the early church, where the early church learned men. Were they scholarly? No. They were uneducated. In fact, everybody knew it. In Acts chapter 4 and 13, when the lame man's there dancing in the temple from being healed, the Pharisees and everybody else took mentioned that, man, these are unlearned men. They're fishermen. But there's one thing that they noticed about them. They are with Jesus. And that's what made all the difference. When they received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, that made all the difference. And then they had doctrinal issues in the early church as well. Um, Acts chapter 15 and verse 1. I don't remember exactly what's going on there, so I better look there. So I can expand quickly. There were some men that came up saying that, you know what? All these new Gentile converts and converts... They all need to be circumcised because that's a sign that God gave us. They didn't realize it was a circumcision of the heart mm -hmm. and they thought it was just all outward. So there were doctrinal issues. What about me offered up to idols? Are we allowed to eat it? Are we not allowed to eat it? Can I put my A1 steak sauce on it or not? So they had all these different issues. Why? Because while the early church was great, that's where we started. But I don't want to be classified as an Acts 2 church because it's a baby church. I will take all the good things from it, but I don't want to be ignorant. I don't want to be unlearned. When it comes to the gifts of the Spirit, Lord, I want you to teach me how to use them. They had to learn church etiquette. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and 34, we have this issue. Let the women be silent in the church. What is this all about? Basically, the church in the days of the early apostles were set up like the Amish community that we would know of today. All the men sat on one side and all the women sat on the other side. And what was happening during church service was the wife was yelling after the husband, What does he mean? What does that verse mean? What was that reference? I forgot it. They were yelling across the church. So Paul said, let the women keep silent. Basically, if you have questions, keep them until afterwards. Not out of a sense of meanness, but we don't want to cause disruption in the church. So let the women keep silent and confer afterwards. It's not a matter of women shouldn't teach or preach. It was a matter of, okay, we can't have yelling back and forth. Or if we had to get more specifically, there might be a little notation that would say, Dennis, don't be yelling over during service. You're disrupting us. So? But that's what that verse is all about. So he had to deal with church etiquette as well. And then finally, we get into Acts chapter 6, where the church wasn't fully as we know of it today. Not that it's perfect today, but the apostles, they try to do too much on their own. Just like Moses did. There was a lot to do, but he couldn't do it all on himself. So, you know what? We're lacking manpower. We need to create the office of the deacon. And they are the ones to go out, take care of the sick and the widows, because there were murmurings in the church that the apostles, they're not going to see my mom who's elderly and way over here. They're not able to go to get to so and so that's been sick and laid up in bed for weeks. So what? We need manpower. We need help. So then they instituted the office of the deacon. And that's where we find Stephen, the first martyr being instituted, man full of faith and the power of the Holy Ghost. So when we look at the early church, there was a lot going on in the early church. Christ gathered, did all his, the best that he could to gather the church, instruct them, train them for three and a half years. And when he's dead, even though he told them they were going to rise from the dead again, the sheep scattered. Then he had to go gather them all back together. And then he goes up on high. And he has to send angels. Hey, I'm gone. Go work. And then they go and wait until Jerusalem, and then everything changes. But when we get to the early church, there were also a lot of flaws, too. So when it comes to the church of Acts, there's a lot of good things. But there's also a lot of bad things, too. So what do we do, like everything else we should be doing through life? Extract the good. Apply to our lives, eliminate the bad, learn from it, and say, Lord, teach me to be what you want.
if need be, or instruct me in the ways that you have me to go. The Bible does not have all the answers on how this gift should be used or that gift should be used because the gifts work individually on, indivi on different people. The Holy Ghost moves differently. But Lord, may we be a church full of power of the Holy Ghost, willing to work, evangelize the lost, edify the believer, and educate one another. That we may, because if it's one thing, this whole Christian work is to, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. If several years before he passed, the great evangelist Billy Graham made a comment, and that was this, if I could do things all over again, instead of going out and holding crusades all over the world, I would just pray more and read my Bible more. Why? Because that's where we build our relationship with God. Any thoughts, any questions as we close? Thank the Lord for that. God's good. Amen. If not, let us bow our heads in prayer and prepare our hearts for service. Absolutely. Absolutely. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and will do. Lord, we thank you that you're God who reigns on high and there's, that there's none like you, Lord. Even right now, we rebuke every attack of the enemy that should come our way. We pray, Lord, that you set your angel at the four corners of the property above and below, and no attack of the enemy may penetrate. I pray that our hearts and our minds will be in one mindset and one accord, that we may worship you in sincerity and truth, that the Holy Ghost may move as he so desires, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you anoint the song leaders and the musicians as they praise you upon the string instruments, upon the vocal cords, Lord. Give them a special blessing. I pray, Lord, that you anoint the pastor's mind and his lips as he brings forth your word today. And anoint our hearts and our minds that we would have a cloud that would be good soil for your word to fall on, that we may remember it throughout the week. But even greater than that, that we may apply it to our lives, that we would be transformed even farther into your very image. And we ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.